If you will, this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, we'll start in verse 14. Uh, I know what some of y'all are thinking. Uh, I'm not really dressed that patriotic. However, I am dressed loyally because last week, if you were unaware, Tennessee won their first ever College World Series. So what better way up here in the north than to celebrate somebody in the south, right? So Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, If you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We praise you for who you are, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you're going to do. I ask that you bless this reading of your word and ask that you write its truths on our hearts that we might not sin against you, but through it that we are sanctified and leave here glorifying your name. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Last week, uh, Pastor Jake preached on a mountain, so to speak, (laughs) The Mount of Transfiguration or the Mount of, it's called Mount Tabor. The reason that we know which mountain it is is because it's the only one there. So uh, the Bible doesn't specifically name it, but we know which one it is. And it's a tall mountain. So they're up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Tabor, and they saw the glory of God revealed through Jesus transformed in front of their eyes and at that moment Peter said he saw Jesus he saw Elijah he saw Moses and he wanted to build a tabernacle to house all three on the mountain in other words they didn't want to go they wanted to stay on that mountain Something really great happened there, and they didn't want to leave. In a few hours, the youth group are going to jump in a van. They're going to go down to Maryland. They're going to go up on a mountain. They're going to, I'm assuming, get rid of all their cell phones, except for the ones that they hide on themselves and whatever. When I was a youth pastor, we would do that too, except, you know, Cell phones weren't that big of a deal back then. You made phone calls. You actually talked on them. You know, you didn't do all the little button things. You could text, but eh, not really. Cell reception, forget it. So it wasn't that much, it wasn't too complicated for us to, to leave our phones behind. But now, you know, that's a cross to bear, getting rid of the cell phone. But anyway, they're going, and they're going to get away. They're going to spend a whole week worshiping. They're going to spend a whole week with other kids that gather together with a like body, and they're going to be worshiping. They're going to be studying the Word of God. They're going to be praising God. They're going to be eating together. Each youth group's going to go to their own youth group meetings. They're going to have devotions. They're going to spend a whole week just diving into Scripture. That's a nice place to be. 
And whenever we would go to camp, we would always come back and we always called it a mountaintop experience or a mountain high, something like that. And you didn't want to come off of it. You want to replicate it. You want to hold on to it because it's special. When I was in the youth group and leading youth group, there was always some of the youth that once they got back from camp, they're going to get baptized again. And then next year, guess what? They had that mountaintop experience, so might as well get baptized again. And they just kept getting re-baptized over and over. We don't want to let go of that mountaintop. So here we have the three disciples. They're with Jesus. They're walking down the mountain. And here's what they see according to the Gospel of Mark. In Mark, it says that they look and they see the disciples at the bottom of the mountain. And they're surrounded by scribes. And they're arguing with one another. So Jesus goes down to them and he asks, What are you arguing about? What's the problem? Scribes didn't say anything. The disciples didn't say anything. But out of the crowd comes a man. And that's where our passage picks up. Verse 14 says, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. The word used here in the Greek is the word lunatic or moonstruck. Now, when we think lunatic, we think something crazy, but it was a Greek goddess of the moon. And it's akin to moonstruck because, let me give you an example of this. The second school that I taught at, well, we always got these little pamphlets that had first aid for all the kids listed on them. So if somebody had a problem in our class, we knew how to deal with it. If they had ADHD or whatever, it's on that list. So there's this one girl, she has a number of health problems, but this wasn't one of them. I'm teaching class, she gets up from her seat, doesn't ask permission, and this is a really nice girl, real polite, she would never interrupt class. She stood up from her seat, she walks towards the door. I'm watching her go thinking, where is she going? You know, she didn't ask to go to the bathroom or anything, but I knew who she was. So I'm just watching her, and she walks to the door. She doesn't open the door. She gets to the door. She stops. Her hands start shaking, and her head goes up and to the left. And I knew what was going on. She was having a seizure, and I knew what I needed to do. So I ran up to her. I didn't tackle her, but I ran up to her. I opened the door. I grabbed her, and I laid down with her. And I held her still, not tight, loose, let her get through what she was getting through. Once she was done, lay her on her side and all of that, because she was having a seizure. And I realized what was going on. I yelled for another teacher that was beside me. He came out. He ran to the office because you never leave someone that's having a seizure. They can do things that can severely hurt themselves. You get them on the ground because they can fall. And when they fall, they they lose all ability to catch themselves. In other words, she had the state of mind to get up and she was going to the bathroom because she knew something was wrong. But on her way there, her body just took over. She had no control. Her nervous system was gone. She couldn't talk back to me. So I couldn't talk to her. She didn't turn and look. There were no voluntary signs that she had. That's exactly what this guy's going through. He sees his son doing this, and he says, My son has seizures. He's moonstruck. Uh, Mark says that he goes dumb. He, he, he's not talking. He, not dumb, mute. He's not talking. He's not communicating back and forth. There's something going on here. He goes into convulsions. He foams at the mouth. He's, whenever we're cooking, he gets thrown into the fire. When we're at the water, he gets thrown into the water and almost drowns. And it, it's, 
it stays with him for a long time because he says it hardly ever leaves or it's difficult for it to leave. In other words, it wasn't just a one-off 10-minute ordeal. This stressed over a long period of time. So it wasn't just seizures. There was something going on that was actually attacking this boy. And this was important because one of the Gospels, I believe it's Luke, tells us that it's this man's only son. Now in that culture, to have a son, that's your namesake. He's going to go on and get married and carry the name. He's the one that's going to inherit everything. Now, if his son is this bad off, no father is going to give his daughter over in marriage because he can't, he can't supply for himself. He can't work. He can't take care of himself. So this is a bad ordeal that's going on. And this man has no other recourse but to go to the disciples so then we see in verse 16 it says and I brought him to your disciples they couldn't heal him and Jesus answered "O faithless and twisted generation how long am I to be with you how long am I to bear with you bring him here to me so you have a pleading father Coming to the disciples. Why would he come to the disciples? He knew that they were there. And earlier in the book of Matthew, it's recorded that Jesus actually gave them the ability to cast out demons. Jesus gave them the ability to heal. Jesus gave them the, the ability to do all sorts of things. So if they've casted out demons, if they've healed and cured illnesses... What's different now? So they go to the disciples. The disciples can't do it. They've lost all the power in able, or to do this. They didn't lose it. They still have it. But they are missing something. So Jesus here points it out, and he tells the disciples, he calls them a faithless and twisted generation. Now, how do we know that he's talking to the disciples and not the crowd? Well, that's a good question. But here the word unfaith, or the, uh, the words that's used for faithless, unfaithful, uh, faithless is a good word to use. Uh, the other word, a twisted generation, a, a generation that's turned. So they've done an about face. They, they went in the other direction. We use the term backsliding for that. They were going this way, and then all of a sudden, they made a, they made a 180, and they're going the other way. So he says, you are a faithless and twisted generation. The crowds were following Jesus out of curiosity. He did miraculous things. It was almost like seeing a magician, except for all the things he was doing wasn't an illusion. It actually happened. He was curing. He was doing things. He was feeding multitudes with nothing. This was crazy stuff. So the crowds were coming out of curiosity. The leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, they were following, trying to get a conviction. They were trying to find something that he was doing so that it would be so damning that they could arrest him and do away with him. So... We have some following out of curiosity, some following out of conviction. The disciples are trusting Jesus to an extent, but oftentimes they're confused. A lot of times they're saying something, or Jesus says something, he has to take a sidebar and explain what it is that he's talking about to the disciples. He'll say, here's what I'm talking about, here we go. Uh, the disciples would ask during the parables, he had a multitude following after him, and then he starts, you know, they, they probably said, hey, Jesus, there's a lot of people here. Maybe you should say something. He's like, all right, I'll say something. Then he turns around, talks about farming and seed throwing and stuff, and then he just turns around and walks off. And they're like, what in the world was that? So they're oftentimes confused. And then Jesus says, how long do I have to be with you? How long do I have to basically prop you up? How long do I have to hold your hands? We have 
four boys. Two of them are college age. One's been in college a couple years. One's about to start this fall. And last year I looked at uh, Brianna one time and I said, you know, I wonder when or if ever my dad looked at me and looked at my brother. And at what point in our lives did he realize, I think they're going to be okay. I think that they'll make it. I know that they'll struggle. I know things will pop up. But I have faith that they're going to make it. They're going to pull through. They're going to work through it. They're going to persevere. In other words, they're able to live on their own. They're able to have a family. And with our boys, I, I look at that and I'm thinking, when will I know that they're ready? When is it going to be something they do? Is it going to be something they say? Is it a certain time? Is it just a look that I'll see? And then I know they're going to be okay. Jesus here is doing the same thing with the disciples. His death is on the front of his mind. Next Sunday, Lord will, and Pastor Todd is going to preach from verse 22 where he starts talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He already told them that before. He's mentioned it a handful of times. This is coming up soon. And he's looking at his disciples saying, how long are we going to have to do this where I keep going back and forth and teaching you what you've already been taught? When are you going to start walking on your own? When are you going to finally let go of my hand and walk out on your own? So then Jesus turns in verse 18. He asks, or at the end of verse 17, he says, Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will impo be impossible for you. So we have a pleading father. We have a group of powerless, somewhat, um, uh, I won't say the word. It's a powerless group of disciples. They're, they're missing something. But then we see the power of God revealed through Christ. Now I want to kind of skip way ahead here in verse 20 and kind of dispel a notion here. A lot of you and some of your translations, if you're NIV or something like that, it'll say something like, um, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, or you might have memorized it that way, as long as you have a little bit of faith, that's not what the text is saying here. Because the disciples definitely had a little bit of faith. <clears throat> the disciples had saving faith. They believe Jesus is who he said that he is. They've seen the things that he's done. He gave them some power to do some miraculous things, so they trusted him. They left their well-being. They left their families they follow Jesus, so they have a trusting faith, they have a saving faith, but they lacked sufficient faith in order to cast out this demon. Now, we know that they have little faith because here in this verse it says, O faithless, twisted generation, and then on down verse 20, because of your little faith. This isn't the first time that Jesus has said this to the disciples. They've heard this before. In Matthew chapter 6, the, the Sermon on the Mount, he says to not be anxious. And then he follows that up with, O ye of little faith. Later on in Matthew chapter 8, he's in a boat. The disciples again are with him. The waves start coming up. It's a terrible storm. Jesus is asleep. And the disciples are losing their minds. 
knowing sure well that they're going to die. They wake Jesus up, and what's he say? O ye of little faith. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus again is on the water. The disciples are in a boat. They see a figure coming to them in the water. It's Jesus walking on the water. He tells them to come out. And Peter takes off and he starts walking on the water. But when he gets closer and closer to Jesus, he starts to sink. Jesus reaches out his hand and says, O ye of little faith. And then just a few Sundays ago, Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is with the disciples again. They go around the sea. There's a group of people coming. And the disciples say, oh no, we didn't bring any bread. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples looked at each other and said, what's he talking about leaven? We don't have any bread. And then Jesus said, why are you talking about bread? Why are we even having this discussion? Just a few weeks ago, we only had a handful of bread and fish. And I fed thousands off of that. And I'm not even talking about that. You know I can supply that. I'm talking about the point of the lesson, which is these Pharisees that are fouling up everything. Beware of them. That was the lesson. The bread and the the fish were the object. But he was pointing to the reason for the lesson. It was to build their faith. And even then, he called them, O ye of little faith. All four of these times, Jesus is with them. Jesus is right there. They're not on their own. They're not left on their own devices. Jesus is literally in front of them every single time. And he's provided for them every step of the way. And still... They lack faith. Their faith is not sufficient. This little faith is kind of characterized about um, trusting in something as long as it's um, as long as things are going well. So if things are going well, then all is all's good. I've got faith. You know, it's easy to get a paycheck and say, I've got faith, I can go get something to eat. But when things are hard and your faith goes because it withers in uncertainty, because you didn't actually have faith, you had faith in what you had in your hand. You didn't have faith in the one that's giving it. So they lack this sufficient faith. There's a group, some of you all know them, Southern Gospel, but they're from Ohio, the Gaithers. And one of the songs that they sing, one of the verses says, You talk of faith when you're up on the mountain, but talk comes easy when life's at its best. But it's down in the valley of trials and temptations, that's where your faith is really put to the test. The disciples were literally on a mountain. They saw Jesus transform in front of their eyes. But as soon as they turned around and the next few verses walked down the mountain and the world comes at them, there's a problem. So instead of seeing the glory of God, you see a demon-possessed boy, a helpless father, and disciples that can't do anything about it. So Jesus points them to the mustard seed. And he doesn't say, as long as you have faith, as small as a mustard seed. He doesn't say that. In the Greek, it doesn't use the word small at all. It uses the word word like. As long as you have faith, like a mustard seed. And he's mentioned this before. In Matthew 13, Matthew 13, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It starts really small. Jesus came from heaven to earth, 
to save sinners, to save his people from their sin, to die for them. It starts small with Jesus. And out of that one seed, it grows and blossoms. You see, a mustard seed, once it's planted, when it's fully grown, gets 20 to 30 feet tall. It doesn't stay a seed. And Jesus is telling the disciples, you all are still seeds. It's time to grow. Stop being little. Stop having little faith. You've been with me and seen all these things. And you still don't have the faith. It's time to grow. Throw out the milk. Grab the steak and let's get going. <clears throat> There's another song that comes to mind. It's, um, it says, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future, and I know who holds my hand. Jesus is who we have our faith. Jesus is the object of our faith. The disciples had the power. Jesus gave them the power. All they had to do was trust and remember where that power came from. In Luke, or not Luke, in Mark, he doesn't use the parable of the mustard seed. What he says is, this type, so these demons, these kinds of demons, can only be dealt with with prayer. With prayer. Well, that seems a lot different than the mustard seed. Until you remember, he's using the mustard seed to say, your faith needs to grow. And at some point, you need to realize that your faith is not in your power. That's not where your faith lies. It's not in you. It's in God. That's where your faith is. That's where it needs to be rooted. That's where it grows. So when we look on here, um, the faith of a mustard seed, faith like a mustard seed, is a, it's a small thing that over time just becomes greater and greater and greater. It's a persistent persistent prayer, persistent faith. It's striving and turning to God when things are bad. A great faith is trusting God when there's nothing in the cupboard. A great faith is a faith in God, a trust in God when your health is gone. When you lose all ability and you can still look and trust in God to do the things that only he can. There's a man, if you ever get the chance to read his biography or a biography about him, his name's George Mueller, great man of faith in the 1800s, contemporary with Spurgeon, actually, they were friends. And George Mueller, it's known that he prayed for five, five of his friends. He had five friends and he said, I'm going to pray for these five guys. All five of them are lost. I want God to save all of them. So he starts praying fervently. And when you read his biography, George Mueller is a prayer guy. Whenever he prayed for something, it came. They ran out of food at the orphanage. He prayed and a truck overturned or, or blew a tire and they had to get rid of the food. So they just threw it all at the orphanage. That type of prayer. Mountain moving prayer. So George Mueller's praying for these five guys. After five years... The first one turns to Jesus as his Savior and Lord. After five more years, so ten years of praying, two more friends are saved by the mercy of God. And then he continues to pray for the other two. After 25 years, the fourth comes to know Christ. And then he continues to pray for the fifth one, and he never sees him turn to Jesus. But a few months after he died, his friend came to know Jesus as his Savior. And it's, 
It was over 50 years of persistent prayer from George Mueller for God to do something that he couldn't do himself, that he knew his friend couldn't do himself. He was praying to God to move the mountain in their heart and save them from their sin. And he was persistent in that prayer. Jesus is telling the disciples, you need to be persistent and you need to pray. There's going to be things that come up in your life, in your ministry, that you cannot make your way through. Sometimes you can navigate through your troubles. Sometimes you can navigate through your sickness. Sometimes you can navigate through financial hard times. But there's going to be a time when you hit a wall and you can't move through. You can't make it over it. You can't go around it. You can't go under it. There's no way to pass. And Jesus said, now if you have faith, like if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you'll never get over it. You'll never get through it. That mountain's always going to be there. And there's nothing that can save you from it. But if you have the faith like a mustard seed, and it has grown, and it's flourished in trusting God, and you know for sure that God will get through this, and you cast all that worry and anxiety on Him, it'll be okay. And Jesus says, that's what you need. That's what you're lacking. You trust me. You, you trust me enough to save you. You trust me enough that you walked away from everything that you have, but you still need to grow in your faith. How long am I going to have to hold your hand? How long am I going to be here? I'm about to die and go away for good until I come back again. You have to learn how to pray. You have to learn that I'm not going to be here to hold your hand. But God will move that mountain. He created it. He can move it. So how do we grow our faith like this? It's easy to say, okay, well, I want my faith to grow. So if I just think about it really hard, it'll, it'll happen. Well, Jesus doesn't leave us to try to figure it out. He kind of makes a map for it. He says that faith comes from hearing. So our faith comes from hearing, and it grows through the hearing of the Word. In other words, listen to sound teaching. Listen to sound preaching. Spend time on your own digging in and wrestling with the Word of God, and your faith will start to take shape. But that alone is white-collar Christianity, and that's not only what Jesus says to do. He also says that we're not to be hearers only, but we're also to be doers, blue-collar Christians. We don't just sit and think through the theory of faith. We go out and we practice that faith. After we learn it, after we see it, after we read it, after we digest it and chew on it, then our bodies can transform it into works, and our faith will grow. And as our faith grows through hearing, through doing, our trust in Him becomes more and more. And we become less and less because we know where our faith is. It's not a thing, it's who we place it in. Where's our nourishment coming from? Now, here today I know that there are people that's going through all kinds of different things. Even milestones that just come up maybe every year, anniversaries of bad things that's happened. You've lost loved ones, a son, a daughter. You've, you've went through times where you start trying to think, is God really there? Does God really love me? Is he, is, is he mad at me? Is he angry? And you're wrestling with your faith. As long as things are going great, 
it's easy. Things are going great. It's easy. You can have your worship and all that. It's when things get tough that Jesus is saying, that's when your faith needs to be more. Because see, the only time out of all these when he called the disciples little faith that he was away from them is when he was on the mountain. And he came back down and they couldn't exercise the demon on their own. Have you ever had your kids and you're like, okay, let me see how independent they are. I'm going to leave them with this job. It's a small job. And let me see if they can be faithful in this small thing. And if they're faithful in this small thing, then maybe they'll be more faithful in larger things. Step by step is how your faith grows. And eventually it starts to blossom. It starts to root. It starts to be grounded in Christ and your trust can go in Him. So if you are going through a time right now of doubt, a time of despair, there's a mountain in front of you. Because Jesus here isn't saying that if we have huge faith, we can go out and actually talk to a mountain and move it. That never happened in Scripture. Nobody moved a mountain in Scripture. Why? Because there's no reason to. Why would you have to move a literal mountain? But he's got this big one behind him, so why not use it as an illustration? And in the Greek times, the mountains that they were facing, he, there, there was a saying that difficult circumstances. When you're facing difficult things, insurmountable things, it's like you're trying to move a mountain. Uh, sometimes we call it pushing a rock, you know. And you just can't, you can't get anywhere with it. So Jesus is looking at the mountain and he's saying, okay, here's a good object lesson. If you have faith that is fully grown and matured, you can say to this problem, a problem as big as this mountain, move from here to there and it'll move. Now this isn't because they're moving it, it's because through prayer and faith in God that he can move those mountains. George Mueller knew that. That's why he prayed. That's why we pray for lost people all around the world. Because we know that God alone can move whatever the mountains are in their lives that's keeping them from turning to Him. So we pray for them. And we do the blue-collar work and we go and proclaim the gospel. Because through hearing, faith comes. Some of you are on a mountain. Everything's going great. And God bless you for it. But you're going to have to come down eventually. You're going to encounter a valley. Or you're going to pass by someone who is going through a valley. Which is why we have a church. So that we can go through these things together. We can continue to point each other to where our faith needs to be. The one who can overcome all obstacles when we feel that we can't. When the disciples struggled, they panicked. And Jesus said, all you had to do was ask. And later on, I believe it's Philippians, Jesus says, or Paul, Jesus through Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, tells us to not be anxious about anything, but in all things, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Knowing that God will answer our prayers, that He is powerful when we are powerless, that He's faithful when our faith is lacking. This man brought his son to Jesus to heal. And Jesus said, well, what do you want? He said, if you if you will, and he said, if I will, and he says, I believe, help my unbelief. And in our Christian walk, in our faith journey, we get to those points where we're just down, we're beaten, and you might be there. And you just look to Jesus and you say, take this off of me. I can't push through anymore. And he says, are you asking me if I can or if I will? 
If you have faith, I believe. But where I don't, help my unbelief. Jesus is there to help. The church, we should be there to help. Being hearers, being doers, and trusting the Lord with every step of our journey. So this morning, if you need to come to the altar and pray for God to lighten your load, for God to come and help you along this way, that you're struggling in your faith, you're in the valley, you're struggling, you can come to the altar, pray in your seat, whatever you need to do to deal with God in this moment. Or if you're on the mountain and you know, okay, God, I I praise you right now, in the good times please remind me of this moment when i'm in the bad remind me of the glory that i see on the mountain when i'm in my lowest and pray that earnestly to god this morning so during this time of invitation deal with ever how you need to i'll take my seat here in the front if you need to come and talk with me or pray with me I'll be glad to pray with you. Or come to the altar, stay in your seat. Stand up and sing praises to God. Because when we're faithless, when we're struggling in our faith, He's always faithful and merciful. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We praise You for who You are, for all that You've done, all that You're doing, and all that You're going to do. I ask that you bless this time that we have of invitation, time of reflection on your word. Father, I pray that we not just sit idly by, but we be doers of what we've heard through your word and not hearers only. Father, I pray that you cause us to stir up and stop having this little faith of a mustard seed and start to plant it, water it, and let it grow and bloom in you. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.